Good morning. Welcome to another episode of Out from the Cube. It is Monday morning, which means it is time for our Monday roundup. If it sounds a little different today, I'm not wearing a headset. I'm trying the audio out without it, and we will see how this works. But uh, again, you can catch me on our YouTube channel for the video of this, which is essentially me just sitting in my kitchen looking into my computer as we talk. So, uh, but again, I appreciate it. It's been a great week. I hope you had a great weekend. Great week. I hope you're excited about your Monday. There's a lot going on. Um, listened to a lot of podcasts last week and there's one, I have, a, again, a page of notes, things to go over, um, things I'm excited about, but it really, as I went through things early this morning and what to talk about and what to cover and what to hit on, um, it really centered around one, one item, uh, you know, one item of content that I uh, listened to maybe two or three times this week that I really wanted to hit on. So I have a, a, a notes from, um, I'm figuring out better ways to give credit to the people I listen to. So um, today's, uh, you know, Lewis Howes, Gary Vee, Brad Stevens, Jeff Tippett, Andy Fursella, those are some of the people I uh, worked with or uh, talked with this week. I didn't talk with all those people. Those are people I listened to this week, but I did talk with Jeff Tippett and uh, Jeff was on our podcast on Thursday. If you haven't had a chance to listen to our Jeff Tippett interview, it was about an hour and 10 minutes. We released it last Thursday. I was really inspired by his talk and what he said and his mission, his vision, his values, how he leads, uh, how he communicates, how he runs his, uh, his own shop of consulting and uh, what he does for a living. I, I found it really inspiring what he does. Uh, the, the theme that kept coming back to me with that conversation last week was uh, to be compelled to do something and then to take action on it. And I'm willing to bet everybody that listens to this podcast at some point today, last week, Saturday, yesterday, Sunday, you feel compelled to do certain things to, to better your life, to better the lives of somebody else in your life. Uh, to provide value to somebody else, whatever it might be, but few of us take that action. And when I say few of us, I really probably mean me. Um, I'm compelled to do things every day, every hour. I feel I am compelled to do certain things and rarely do I take action on all those things. If ever, I guess I would say never do I take action on all those things. Rarely do I take action on half of those things and I'll pick and choose the things that I take action on, which in my mind is lost opportunity, opportunities to provide a service or uh, provide you know, a service to somebody else uh, and uh, to my family, to my community that I'm around here in St. Louis, to my employer, to my clients, um, those being compelled. So again, when I got off the, the call with Jeff on Thursday, um, I was really inspired by him, and I, I, that's just not me saying anything. I thought he was a phenomenal person, and I thought that that time spent with him was life-changing, and it should have been life-changing for you. It's just a matter of taking, adjusting those dials as you listen and taking things away and being inspired by his story. Um, so the, the thought that I kind of wrote down was being compelled, but uh, we're all compelled to do things, but it's the idea of taking action. If you don't if you have not listened to Jeff Tippett, uh, the, the short story to what he did was he went out and had dinner with his dad uh, who had just returned from Haiti and had pictures of children in need, uh, need of homes, need of food, need of water, need of shelter. And as his dad told this story to Jeff, Jeff felt compelled uh, to provide a home for one of these little girls that I think he may have said was six months old. So he took action to adopt that little girl. And at one point he said, I had knives to my neck and guns to my head, telling me to leave, telling me uh, to not do it, or telling, just kind of getting after him. And he still felt compelled enough to uh, continue with that journey and to get that little girl and to adopt her. So I thought that was inspiring. You know, that is, you know, dialing it to 10 to want to do something great. and. Uh, and I think that that's us in our business lives. I really believe that it's me with my, uh, my professional life. It, it's probably you and your professional life that we are compelled to do great things every single day. We're compelled to do great things. And rarely do we take that big action, 
that massive action plan and jump out on a ledge and step out on the ledge and take those steps necessary to, uh, to provide a service to somebody, to, uh, to provide a service for yourself where you can have a better career, a better impact, provide more value. And we're just so happy to sit in our queue um, where Jeff wasn't and his life has been altered. But more importantly, I would say that little girl's life has been altered that he was able to adopt all because he can, all because I'll say this. And we said this in the episode, his why was big enough. The reason why he was doing it was so big with a gun to his head and a knife to his neck. He still felt compelled to move forward because his why was big enough. If your why is big enough, if my why is big enough, my belief is we can do anything, anything in our lives. But if our why is small enough, the first time, to use his example, the first time a knife is to our neck or a gun is to our head, and I know those are things that typically do not happen to people, so I'm not trying to draw this big you know, story to it all, but it's so easy to quit. The first time somebody says you're not good enough, not smart enough, not talented enough, don't have the resources, don't have the money, um, it's a dumb idea, then we just fall apart. Our why isn't big enough. Um, I have run into, I go to a media, I go to a networking event here in St. Louis. I used to go every week. I now go every other Thursday. It's down in the city. And I have run into a lady at this for the past three or four weeks. It is a startup community. People go with ideas and people try to pitch different things and try to connect and try to find the resources available to them to try to make some of these startups work. And it's, you know, a lot of smart people, a lot of fun, a lot of people just wanting to serve one another. I think it's great. But the last three or four weeks I've gone, I've talked to the same lady and she has a different idea every week. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that that is bad to always have a different idea every two weeks. But every time I, I bring it up, hey, you were doing this recycling project two weeks ago. Tell me what's still going on with that. Well, it wasn't working. I talked to these people and it wasn't a good idea. It wasn't. So I've moved on to other things, which I understand. I'm not painting a bad picture of, of her innovation, of her drive or anything like that. But it's just that mindset of the first no, of the first you're not smart enough, of the first that it'll never work. But if your why is big enough, I would say this, maybe that, uh, that lady, her why just isn't big enough. And so when she does come across the first road, uh, the roadblock or the first uh, bump in the road, it's easy just to say, well, what other ideas do I have? So that was kind of my week. But again, I guess that all circles back around to making sure that uh, if you have the time, it's an hour and 10 minutes. I also have it on my YouTube channel, but go listen to Jeff Tippett and then reach out to him on LinkedIn and reach out to him on Twitter. Uh, I was, I, I was really, uh, really uh, inspired by what he's doing. And that's what this is all about. All, uh, what this is all about is to, is, to, uh, is to build a community, a network of people that are listening and reaching out to one another and encouraging one another. And being, being, there's a difference between judgment. This is Gary Vee. Difference between judgment and feedback, right? I don't, uh, you know, people are going to judge me. This is stupid. You know, your house isn't finished. You've got, you know, these lights up in the back. You're in your kit. Like, this is stupid, right? I get it but I enjoy it. Um, I, got a, I got a text message this week. I'm gonna find it this week. Uh, I don't do this to, uh, to sit there and say I'm doing these great things or anything like this, um, but I, it was really uh, the, the time spent uh, and the feedback, and it, all it takes is one. To, get to, to continue to build your why, sometimes it just takes one. Listen to your last couple of podcasts during my workouts. Phenomenal stuff. You were made for this. Keep up the great work. Hope your family is doing well. Like, how does that not juice you up? And that's, that's about the podcast. Uh, it was a text message to me, but I don't say that to pat myself on the back. It is nice. But it's amazing that one thing can get you continue to move forward. It's amazing how just one, I could have a ton of people think this is ridiculous, but one person reaches out and says something like that, and you continue to kind of move down that line. So I'm saying this, if you are running teams, 
if you are a leader, if you are in charge, if people are looking to you for answers, or even if you're not, even if you are just a, a flat organization, random text, random hand on the back, random let me take you out to lunch, and sitting there saying, I think what you're doing is phenomenal. It, it is providing value. You are really good at it. I hope you keep grinding. Hope your family's doing well. Wow. Just small little things like that keep the train going down the tracks. And it's impactful. And you're influencing people. And I use this phrase, you are building your army. You're building your army every day. This is a, a it's, it's okay, this is a friend that sent that to me, a very good friend, okay? Um, one of the best people I've ever met in my life, and he listens to this, and I will say he's one of the top three or four or five people I've ever met in my life that sent me that. So I'm, I'm gonna say that, so we are friends, okay? But that just that reaching out just changes moving the train down, gets you inspired, gets you moving forward, and I'm, all I'm suggesting is this week, find those moments, where you can really encourage somebody and keep them moving towards their mission, their goals, their dreams, the client, the business value, whatever it might be. Like, I think that's impactful. Okay. So here's my first 30 second time. I got it. I'm going to take a drink of my coffee. Now, what impacted me this week? And I could go on and on and on about this. If you do not have time this week to listen to Lewis Howes, Lewis Howes actually is a St. Louis, and well, he's actually from Ohio. He went to high school and college here, um, and I always mispronounce it, Principia. Principia High School, Principia University here in St. Louis. I need to know that because now my boys, you know we do a lot of basketball, my boys have weekly practices at Principia. So Lewis Howes is a St. Louisan. He made his mark by uh, getting big time on LinkedIn. He's got all sorts of kind of videos and things he does on how to leverage LinkedIn and connect and build a network. That's how he got going. Now he's this big time lifestyle entrepreneur, maybe is his tagline. But this Pat, and he, he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal. And I know somebody that, that knows Lewis a little bit. But if any of you know Lewis, we want him, we want, he's like a, the big target guy, right? We had Alan Stein on, he was somebody I wrote down. Lewis is another one. Now, Lewis is big time. Lewis is not going to – Lewis has a studio. He doesn't do this from his kitchen table with fans and lights in his backyard. Okay, Lewis is a big time guy. But Lewis, this week, if you don't have time – if you have time, go back and listen to this. If you don't have time, I'm going to go through it. He had an interview with Kobe Bryant. For those that don't know, that listen to this, that are in the tech space, that may not know, not just because you're in the tech space you wouldn't know, but anybody that doesn't know this. Kobe Bryant is a, a retired basketball player. He played 19, 20 years. All of his years were played with the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, he has retired, I think, the past two years. Maybe he just finished his first year not playing, maybe, his, maybe two. I think just one. He is now in the business. He's actually won an Oscar, I believe. He put a short story out, a short cartoon out uh, about basketball. Uh, maybe uh, and somebody can send me a message, correct me. I actually haven't seen it in its entirety. Uh, but he had, it did win up an Oscar for it. Uh, now he is in the business world. What I admire about Kobe is, I guess, two things right now. One is he, he's humble enough to know what he doesn't know. He knows basketball. He knows competing. He knows team and uh, team behavior, team dynamics, motivation, the X's and O's, strategy, whatever you might like. He knows that. What he says he doesn't know is how the business world works, what to do post-basketball. Now, he came in the league at 19, 39, 40. Let's, rough, let's estimate that. He's 40 years old. The guy's got 40 more years to go of making an impact, of being smart with his money, about business, about other people and service and his family. He's got all this time, and he's not sitting around. What I admire most about Kobe is he knows what he doesn't know, and his mission right now is to go out to companies, CEOs, teams and organizations, and ask questions. He is going around to Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and talking with Cook and Zuckerberg and all the and Bezos, all these people that are running these companies that have billions of dollars, 
and Kobe is going in like a newbie. I don't know any of this. I don't know what I'm doing. Teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. Now, what a great position to be in that you can pick up your phone and call Bezos and Zuckerberg and get, and get a return call, right? Uh, and then not only get a return call from them or somebody that represents them, but also schedule a meeting with them. Yes, that's a great. I could roll in with 100 questions and be ready, um, but I'm not getting that call. I'm not getting that invite, and I'm not getting uh, that opportunity. But he does. So he's also learning. So he sat down with Gary Vee, and they talked about really his basketball. Let me, let me also circle back. I said two reasons why I admire Kobe. Two is – now that he is retired, for the coaches that are out there uh, that listen to this, now that he is retired, I have watched more of him. I have studied him more. And what I find fascinating about Kobe Bryant is he's got this, he's got a nickname called the Black Mamba, and he calls it his Mamba mentality. And if you watch the video, a Mamba's a snake. If you watch this video with Lewis Howes, they are sitting in two chairs between a fireplace and there's a picture on top of the fireplace, which is a black mamba. So it, it is something he lives. And he's got a mamba mindset, this attack, killer instinct, getting after it mindset. And that mindset has attracted me, where I now study the guy, not basketball-wise, work ethic-wise, commitment-wise, uh, determination, uh, focusing on fundamentals, team, like I've started to do that a lot. So my admiration for that guy, where it just used to be, yeah, whatever, uh, I admire him when I see him. Now I'm thinking about him, trying to study him, trying to figure out, um, you know, what he does to make him great and how I can kind of incorporate some of that as well. So I wanted to go through Really just that interview with Kobe and some of the things he said today. That's really all I wanted to do. But this is, this is what he says, and I'm going to start with this because I think he kind of said this in an interview, but I saw it in a different interview. Uh, and I really like this, and I, with the groups that I've worked with, I have said this. Now, understand, when I say basketball, it's not just basketball or sports. This is business. This is life. This is me teaching my kids. If you listen to this and have children – this is you teaching your kids, not basketball, but it is a basketball story. I want to be very upfront with that because I know if you listen to this, you know by now that I am, oh, there's always going to be a sports story. It's going to be around because I think the leadership and the lessons and the determination and those elite people uh, do things a certain way and it's visible and there's books on it and there's articles on it and it's things I'm passionate about and into. So I get it. Kobe Bryant says this basketball is math. It's math. Being great at basketball is simply a math equation. And I have said this to the people I work with. And it's not just about basketball. Kobe Bryant has this story. I'm not going to get it perfect. But he essentially says, most players in the NBA are going to maybe get in some workout during the day where they go maybe for two to three hours, maybe two to four hours. The, maybe the best ones go four or so hours. Most maybe go two to three, let's say. So what he said he figured out early in his career, and I am going to circle back to business and your personal development and my personal development, is he said it's a math game. He said if I could just get in the gym at 4 a.m., 4 a.m., if I could get up at 3, get to the gym at 4, go 4 to 6, 4 to 6.30, get home shower, breakfast, time with kids, business calls, whatever, endorsements, whatever. Be back in the gym at 10, go 10 to 12, work out hard, be done at one or be done at 12, shower, calls, family, pick daughter up from school, back in the gym at four, four to 6.30, home, dinner, family, put kids to bed, rest, nutrition, all that, right? So Colby figured it out at a young age that it's math. It's, yes, there is some God-given ability. God blessed him with certain things. Athleticism, 6'7", six, 6'8", six, whatever it is. But he honed his skill. 
And he figured it out that over even one day, just one day, you take one day. If I am putting in six to seven hours a day of work on my skill, my craft, and everybody else is putting two to three in, I'm four hours ahead. It's a math equation. I'm four hours ahead of that work that you put in. One day, four hours, right? So I'm not the math guy, and I don't have exactly what he said, but you take that four hours, and if you're gonna multiply that just by, that's 1,400 hours, right? That's 1,400 hours, okay? And you divide that, we're talking about 58 days. Now these are, painting a broad stroke here, I get it. But Colby is sitting around saying, over the course of a year, if I put in four more hours than you do, and I do it every day, there's, no, there's a grind to it every single day. I'm working out 58 more days than you are. 58 more days than you are. And that's one year. And he said it's a math equation. Because after four years, there's no way you're catching me. You will not catch me. It's all because I'm continuing to grind. I'm continuing to put the time in. And no matter where you're at behind me, I'm only distancing myself more. So that, that was profound to me. Now, how does that deal with business? That's not just basketball. I want my kids to know this. I want the people that the teams I work with. I want even the professional teams I work with. That if you just put in the time, now we were going to get into fundamentals and the basics and doing the doing great things over and over again, or doing kind of your weak things until they become strengths over and over and over again. So we're going to get into that. But basically, Kobe was saying, "Man, I'm just going to grind it, and I'm going to be 58 days ahead of you." Now, I, you know, I here's a bad story, but when I was 38, I bought a guitar. And you know what? I just wanted to be able to play that guitar at 60 years old. That was my goal. I didn't have goals of being in a band. I didn't have goals of playing on a stage or being able to do a song or any of that sort of stuff with my guitar at 39 years old, a year after. All I wanted to do was say 38, 48, 58, 2. In 22 years, I'd like to be able to play that guitar and be like a blues guitarist. All I knew is, is I was doing an hour and a half every morning since 38. I'm 45. Now I've stopped recently, right? But I went five or six years every morning for an hour and a half. Now that doesn't, I'm not that great at it. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying that grind on a skill that you want to master, if you just do an hour a day extra, or you figure out, hey, I'm going to get up an hour earlier and do this, and then I'm going to stay up later and do this, and I'm going to grind it out because I don't care where I'm at. I care where I will be. I will be where I'm 60, or I will be when I'm 30, or where I will be when I'm 45. Okay? Kobe Bryant, to get into some of the quotes from Lewis Howes, you can be whatever you want. I'm going to kind of phrase this how, uh, how I heard him say it. You can be whatever you want to be in life. You can be whatever you want to be in life, but it comes with work. That's from Kobe. The th reality is I don't want my, uh, and I'm, uh, this just makes sense to me when I correlate it and pass it along to my kid, when I think about my kids. I don't want my kids to be 60 years old and figure this stuff out. As we get older, we figure this out. I have, I'm trying to figure it out at 45. So when I'm 60, I can play that stinking guitar. Right? I want to figure out as early as possible. Kobe Bryant figured it out as early as possible. Here's what he said. Here's the story from Kobe Bryant, and it's phenomenal. When Kobe Bryant was 14, 13, no, 10. When he was 10 or 11 years old, he played in a league in Philadelphia where he grew up, and it was the best league in the area. Okay? It was the best league in the area, and he said the first year he played in that league, he did not score a single point. He was the worst player in the league. Didn't score a point. Not, and he says, not a layup, not a free throw, not, a turn, not scoring off a turnover, not throwing it up and praying it goes in. 
Nothing went in the whole summer, and he was the worst. One, something happened. I, lo I, I love this stuff. Now I'm juiced up. Now something happened. Somebody said something to him that changed his life. And it happened to be his dad. And I have it quoted here. I love you no matter what. I don't, he said, if you score 60 or you score zero, I love you no matter what. That phrase changed his life. So what he said was, I love you no matter what. And what that created, and Colby says it in the interview, it created confidence in me that I could fail and mess up. And no matter what, I was getting in the car with somebody that believed in me, that loved me, that would encourage me, that would continue to work, work me out, practice with me, all that. And it created safety. Now, that's impactful to me. I hope, I hope, this, I hope this juices you up. It's his dad saying, I love you no matter what, after the worst summer and being the worst player and never scoring. Now, how did, what does that have to do with anything? With business, being on a team, running a professional company, being an entrepreneur, being a leader, or anything. Sometimes the people we work with struggle. Sometimes they're not the best. Sometimes you're counting on them and they don't deliver. And sometimes you need to put your arm around them and say, you're not gonna say this. I understand you wouldn't say this in a professional world, but I love you no matter what goes on. Like I'm all in. Here's the chips. I go center table. I hired you for a reason. I hired you for a purpose. You are phenomenal at what you do. Keep going. And I love you no matter what. So you can get in that car at the end of the day and drive home and say, man, that person believes in me. That company believes in me. That client believes in me. Or I'm going to do this so that person, I can encourage that person. And build confidence and safety like Kobe Bryant says. His dad said, I love you no matter what. And that changed his life. It didn't just change him for a day. But then he comes back and says, I can do whatever I want. And I can be whoever I want. But it's going to come with work. So Kobe Bryant goes, now he's got this confidence. He's got this safety to fail. He's committed. He's passionate. He loves it. He knew this. He says, I wasn't going to catch those kids in a year or a month or a year. I was not going to catch those kids that I competed against in a month or a year. But he said he went back and he created a menu and chunked up skills. What he wants to do. And he worked on them in three to four month batches. I'm going to focus on shooting the basketball for the next three months with perfect form or ball handling or coming off, whatever it is. And I'm gonna do, I'm gonna grind on that for three months. And then I'm gonna find another thing, then another thing. And I'm gonna batch it up. And I'm going to create a menu of things to work on. And I'm gonna chunk it up. I'm reading that from, from that interview. I encourage you to figure out why you didn't score any points last summer in your summer league and I'm going to encourage you to come up with a menu of things that you are weak at or even that you're strong at, which we'll get into. And I'm going to ask you to grind on that for three to four months every day because being great is math. Basketball, guitar, chess, language, like IT language. You know, leadership, reading books about leadership, communication, your family, whatever it is, I'm going to isolate this and I'm going to master that sucker over the next three months. Or I'm going to build it so that weakness 
is not, maybe it's not my best strength, biggest strength, something I lean on, something that gets me out of trouble, but it's a whole heck of a lot better than it was. So Kobe Bryant goes back the second summer and he's better. And he understands it's a math game. And now all of a sudden he goes back and he chunks it up again. And he plays and he gets better. And the next summer goes by. Listen to this, what he says. That started at 10 or 11. Now, he's 14. He's a freshman in high school. And he said this. I went back to that league. And by the time I was 14, I was the best player. But he says this. I wasn't the, just the best player in that league. The best. I was the best player in the state. The entire state, he was the best player at 14, 15 years old. Because he figured out how to chunk things up and how to put in more time than somebody else. Now, everybody talks about the grind and the hustle and putting in the time, which I get and I love it. And I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure out how to squeeze. Somebody said this in, on one of our podcasts. I got to figure out how to get 28 hours out of 24. I got to figure that out. Now you can't, but you can. You've got to figure out how to get more hours out of the day. And it's all simply prioritizing. So let me go back to some of these things with Colby. Create a menu of things to work on and chunk it up. Being great, it's all math. And he said he spent so much time figuring out ways to get better every day. We've talked about 1% every day, where you're going to be, how, you know, my buddy that texts me and says, I listen to your podcast when I'm working out. Where, is he, where does he want? What are his outcomes? What are his goals health-wise? Not going to do it tomorrow. He's not going to do it a month from now. But if his why is big enough, and he's sitting around saying, I want to be able to do this in a year, or I want to have this type of health when I'm 50, you can do anything. It takes being in the gym every day and grinding it out and prioritizing what's important to you. Kobe said this. It was maybe the first, uh, it wasn't the first question. It was the first question I heard on a snippet. Lewis Howes asks him, what does losing feel like to you. Now here's the most competitive person that maybe has played that game other than Jordan, Michael Jordan. And he said this, which is interesting to me because I didn't expect this answer, but once he answered it, I knew where he was going to go with the response. And I would be interested in what Michael Jordan would have to say about the same thing. But he says this, what does losing feel like to you? And he says this, it's exciting. That was his response. It's exciting. It means you have different ways to get better. It means you have different ways to get better. So his thing is this, IT, software, leadership, sales, shoe sales, car sales, whatever it is. I caught, we talk about those being at-bats. Getting at bats. Now, if you have enough at bats and you're still batting 0% or you're batting a buck 20, then we've got other issues that we've got to solve. But any at bat you can get. It's exciting when you lose. It means you can figure out, it means you have different ways to get better. So in the business world, what we talk about is failing, failing fast. We talk about I don't know how much we've used this word, but having a retro, a retrospective where you sit down with your team and you sit with them every day and you sit and talk about what we did well, what didn't we do well, how can we improve, and really adjusting the dials on a daily basis. If I could go back and be a coach at the college at any level, um, and I say this in the world of athletics because I do coaching now with, uh, with teams and we do this, but I would have so many retrospectives, you know, I, and I, and I wouldn't be on like, I'm in the IT world. So we have these retrospectives really based on a sprint 
which is like, hey, I'm going to do two weeks worth of work. And then that Friday afterwards, we're going to sit and we're going to uh, see what went well for those two weeks. But I believe in like every day, like always messing around with the dials. Now, you can't have everybody in every meeting and have these things where you're just wasting time doing all these things. I get that. But I would always be sitting around and being introspective and thinking about my team, what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, and being able to pivot quickly or adjust if that's on a one or two week deal. But I do like that. I'd sit back as a coach in the athletic space and I would always be sitting back saying, hey, what did we do well? What didn't we do well? This is what we're focused on for the next week. This is what we're focused on for the next two weeks. Chunk those up and really figure out and really talk about what those things are because that's how you get better. When things don't go right, then you have to quickly think, like in coaching, in coaching you have your pregame where you're talking about what you're going to do, the uh, things we want to take advantage of, things we want to do great, the roles people play, who's doing what, how we want them to do it, what we're going to start the game out with. You're doing all those things. Game starts. You're going to sit there and call timeouts. We're, doing, we're not doing this. We talked about doing this. We're not. We're doing this really well. Hey, Jimmy and Joe, Johnny, you guys keep doing this. You're doing really well. This, this is not going well for them. Let's do this. This is not going well. We've got to do better at this. Those are retrospectives. And we're figuring out if things aren't going well, if you're losing, right? And you can sit back and adjust as you need be because you can figure out the solutions. I would own the losing. This is me. This is not Kobe. I would own the losing personally. Anything that goes bad with your teams, I would sit and own it all. Anything that goes wrong. Now, you don't want to own it, own yourself out of a job where somebody's sitting back saying, man, it's always his fault. He seems to always be saying he's messing up. Why is he always messing up? Well, we need to find somebody different than that, right? But there's this humble ownership where you're sitting there saying, you know what? If you're sitting in a retrospective and you're going around the room and people are just blaming everybody else, why can't you be the guy to raise your hand and say, you know what? I appreciate that, you know, you could have done a better job with this, but I could have probably helped you more. I could have supported you more. And I actually knew something about that subject matter. I knew something about X and I didn't step in and help you with it. So next time I'm going to do a better job. I'll, I will make sure I do a better job. Um, I used to say, I, me, my, let's not say those things. But if you're sitting around owning things, it's okay to sit there and say, you know what, I could have done a better job. Hey, Johnny, I could have helped you better. I could have supported you more. That's my fault. I will make sure that doesn't happen again. We are capable of more. We can do better with this sprint, with this sales call, with this investment, with this client. We can do better. And I'm committed to this. I will do a better job with this. Weaknesses exposed, there's always, there's answers in there. Kobe Bryant. When weaknesses are exposed, there's going to be answers in those weaknesses or those problems or those failures. We've talked about failures. Don't believe in failure, but believe in learning. It's only a failure if you don't learn. You can't sit there and say, well, shit, I'm bad at this. I failed at this. Let's move on. I've got to find something else. I got to find another product. I got to innovate a different idea because somebody told me no. Instead of sitting in there saying, there's answers in there. There's a way we can do better. I humble, humbly own the, the, the problem or the losing. Because when I do that, I also own the solution. I own the solution. And you own taking it all in. You own pivoting. You own adjusting the dials and everything instead of sitting there blaming other people, their fault, they could have done better and sitting there saying, well, I hope they get their crap together. He says this, the question was, how do you get the best out of your teammates? How do you get the best out of your teammates? Everybody that listens to this, for the most part, 
So I shouldn't use the word everybody, but everybody that listens to this has a team. And how do you get the best out of all your teammates? What can you do? You can set a standard. Kobe Bryant tells the story of this. There is, I, I love this story. Okay, so listen, listen to this story. And it's not basketball, related. it's basketball story, but it's not just for basketball. But think about the standards you place on yourself. Because Kobe Bryant had these crazy standards. And that's why he was the best. You don't think that Bezos and Zuckerman and Cook and Steve Jobs and, all, and, and, and Bill Gates and all these people that have ran these and these great companies have these incredible standards that they set. Now, my background's just in sports, and those are the people I study. But if you read those books about those people, I'm willing to bet they had these crazy standards that made them the best. And the reality is nobody is willing to play at those standards, and that's why all of us are in our cubicles. And it's not, I'm not saying you, I'm saying me. We all have those 24 hours. Maybe Bezos and Zuckerberg and those other people figure out how to get 28 out of 24. And I don't. Kobe Bryant says this story. They're on the road in the NBA a lot. And he has a standard. We're going to, I, I personally, you want to play at my level. You want to be me. You want to get the shots, the endorsements, the money, the contracts, the winning, the rings, the MVP trophies, the NBA fight. You want that? Play at my standard. Do what I do. Do what I do. Hey, I want to go drinking. Let's go party. We're in Miami. We're playing a road game in Miami as the Los Angeles Lakers. Kobe says, hey, they want to go drinking. People on the team just want to go out and party in South Beach. Kobe's like, ah, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. No, we're going. Kobe's like, okay, we're going. I'll go with you. And Kobe Bryant said he's very uh, disciplined with partying and drinking and all this sort of stuff. But there's a sacrifice. There's a standard. There's priorities to be great there's standards to be great and what is your number one priority colby was was this i'm working out at four or five in the morning priority that's why i'm the best they go out and party they get in at 12 1 2 in the morning right four in the morning he's banging on everybody's door let's go you guys want to be great. You guys said these things. You want to play at my level. Kobe's ready to go. His standards were so high. And he demanded his teammates perform at a, at a level that they didn't, weren't playing with. Now, what I have read about Kobe is he's probably really hard to play with because his standards are so high. And he expects you to bring it every single day at his level to play at that le uh, play a championship level. You know what? If you had that level of success, those contracts, those endorsements, those rings, you know, that those championships, would you care how many people dislike playing with you? Or what about those guys that have all those rings with you that said, "Hey, I wasn't as talented as him because the math game had already started and he was so far ahead and he was blessed with certain skills." and size and strength and speed, right? But man, he's the best teammate out He got the most out of me. His standards were so high and he demanded that of me and he was a great leader that I followed along and some people didn't want to. So this is what he says. How to get the best out of your teammates. And this is what he says. You have to affect their behavior. You have to affect their behavior. You have to get to a point where you have a guy that is sitting around that wants to be as great as Colby, that wants to win a championship, that wants to get that client, that sales call, that recruit, or that client, and saying, if you want that level, if you want to go from a $50,000 client to a hundred or to $500,000 clients, there's got to be a standard in place. And we've got to play this way. We've got to change your behavior. So that guy that wants to go out and have a few drinks at 10 o'clock at night when they've got a game the next morning, 
or the next night and Colby wants to work out at four in the morning, he has to change that behavior, that mindset. So how can we change those mindsets? How can we change our own mindset to where we end up being our own black mamba? To where people look at you differently because the standards you set, the grind you put on, how you get 28 out of 24, right? Maybe that should be the podcast name. If you like that name, send me a message because I'm not sold on Out From The Cube yet. 28 out of 24. We've got to get 28 hours out of 24. And I'm not saying it's all work related. Because I'll tell you right now, I wish I could squeeze out two, three more hours out of my life with my children. I wish I could squeeze out two to three more hours out of the life of my community here and spending time with the people I'm connected with in my little St. Saint, Saint Charles community. Because they're phenomenal people and lift me up. And I have a great time going through life with them. I wish I could figure that out. I wish I could squeeze out four more hours out of my day so I could read so i could read and study and go through the this is my way of the seal book that you need to get that i could spend more time reading through this thing which i don't have time for right and i recommended this book the two second lean now if you're listening to the podcast i'm holding books up two second lean like when do i have time for all that 28 out of 24 reality is i do have time i'm making excuses for not being great i do have time what i'm not doing well is prioritizing how to be great. The spirit, this is Colby. Let me, let me put an exclamation mark on this. How do you get the best out of your teammates? You have to affect your behavior. There is so much in team dynamics that is this, human psychology, human behavior, behavior for the team. And Colby says this, it's the most important thing. It's the most important thing. Let me ask you this, and I may have said this in another podcast, but think about this. In your mind, as you're listening to this, working out, driving, out in San Francisco, up in uh, Bellingham, Washington now, we have people listening up there, a friend of mine. Think about this as you're getting ready and listening to this. What are the most important things for your team, company, organization? Just think in your mind, like what is the most important thing? What are the most important things your team, company, organization? If you're in IT, is it your standards for code and checking in code and DevOps or Scrum or standups or how your sprint goes? Like if you were to say, hey, because this is what you can say. If you're a basketball coach, this is what you're saying. Man, what's the most important thing? Offense, defense, rebounding, special teams if you're a football guy, offense, defense, special teams, running game, passing game. What's the most important thing to your team? And, you know, they used to say, you know, Pat Summit at Tennessee was all about rebounding. Defense wins, you know, uh, you know, offense fills the stands. Defense wins championships, rebounding, something along those lines, right? Defense wins championships. We've all heard that. What's the most important thing to you and your company? How much time do you spend on that one thing? If you're sitting around saying, man, most important thing to us is our offense. I want to score points if you're, an, if you're a basketball group, right? If you're talking, hey, you know what's most important to us is getting work items through a sprint. And I want to make sure that we get 30 story points done a week. Or I want to have these clients close and how many clients we close a week. That's what's most important to us. That's what we talk the most about. Now, I will say this. I think the most important thing that you should have and I would put this number one, and I would consider it, and I hope this throws you for a loop, and I, maybe we've said this before, the most important thing to your team is your team. That is the most important thing. Your team is the most important thing. And you can sit there and shake your head and drive the car and sit there and say, you know what, he's right, and that's great, and I haven't thought about that before. Now, if you said offense is the most important thing or a sales or work items or whatever it might be, and you focus all your attention on coaching that or leading that, but then you're sitting there shaking your head saying that the team is the most important thing. How much time today, this week, this sprint, this meeting, this Monday morning, are you spending building your team? How much time? 
When I was a basketball coach, we had less talented teams perform better than our super talented teams because they were better teams. Better, you've heard the phrase, team chemistry. Oh, our chemistry is so much better. We had our best player and he was an idiot. And we got rid of him and our team became better. We got rid of so-and-so and we had to fire him and he was our best sales rep. But something changed when we got rid of him. The sales team, the investment team, whatever it might be, we got better when we got rid of our, our best. We became a team. Our chemistry was better. How much time do you spend on that? Kobe Bryant says, it's the most important thing. The most important thing. This is what he says, and I'm going to end with a few things uh, right after this. The spirit of your team must be good. The spirit of your team. Every I, I think there's a rhythm, a vibe, an energy, a connectedness to every team. Every single team has juice, vibe, energy, a rhythm. I believe that. What is the spirit of your team? Because that's what Kobe Bryant says. Because it must be good. Every single person listening that has a team, you are going to go through ups and downs. And when you go down and when you don't get the client or you don't get the sales call or you don't get the, the win or you don't get the, uh, the client, you don't deliver the product and you're in the bottom of the valley, if the spirit of your team is not good, it is going to crack. Your team will fracture, Kobe says. It will fracture. And if you're a basketball coach or played on a team, an athletic team, which I hope is most of you, can't you sit there and be in a tight game or a game where you were down by five and you're grinding it, trying to win, but then you know the minute. You can know the second the moment, the situation, when you sat there and said, we're going to lose. We just lost. There's still 10 minutes to go. We're down five, and we're going to lose. Because the energy of the team is not good. It's fractured. There's bickering. There's blame. There's finger pointing. There's no connectedness. There's no competitiveness. There's no great standard set for you to crush it the last five minutes. Instead of the team that sits there and says they're down five with five to go, and the coach is sitting there saying, we got them where we want them, and everybody's sitting around saying, we're gonna win this. Now, how is that for you in your business with life? You know when you're gonna lose a client. And there are people that are about to lose clients that sit there and the leader will sit there and say, watch this. Watch my team. Watch our team. Watch our team respond to this. Watch our team get this client. Watch what our team does next. Watch how we rally around each other in a bad situation to find solutions where we don't blame, we don't finger point, we have high standards, high accountability, and watch what we do. Watch what we do. And everybody's on board, and it's not your best player saying, I need to get more shots. It's somebody else's fault. Spirit of your team must be good. That's when teams fracture. Okay, I'm going to end with this. I've enjoyed this. This has been great because I love going through those notes. Lewis Howes and Kobe Bryant. I did not get this from uh, Lewis or, or Kobe, and I didn't earmark it who I got it from. I'm doing a better job of creating credit, of uh, uh, giving credit to the people that give me some of this stuff. I figured out a little system. But – we talk about failing and failing fast and every mistake you make is good and that you can learn from it and all that. But this resonated with me this week. Let's just be people that make new mistakes. Let's not have teams, groups, where we're always making the same mistake and sitting back saying, well, let's just learn. It's not failure. But man, if I keep not closing a sales deal, over and over again for the same stinking reason, at some point I've got to make new mistakes. Make new mistakes. Okay? Uh, there's other things I was going to bring up. Let me ask you this as we leave because it was my thought for the week at the top of my planning sheets. These are my planning sheets up at the top. It says, 
What's the next three months look like? We're getting ready to roll into October, November, December. That's the last quarter of the year. There's a great book called 12 Week Years, 12 Week Year, I believe, The 12 Week Year. I'll have it uh, for you next time. It's a great book, but it talks about chunking your life and business into four quarters of a year and not having this one year plan where all of a sudden November, December, we're cramming to try to meet our goals that we set in January that we've already forgot about. But let's think about October, November, December. What, how do we want this year to end? But more importantly, I guess I would say this, it is September 17th. This quarter's about to end, right? July, August, September. July, August, September, that it was my quarter. I had quarter goals. I've got like two weeks left. I've got to figure out how to crush this last quarter. So now I'm, I shouldn't be cramming, but I'm cramming for this quarter because I want to crush the rest of this quarter, okay? Then I want to get ready for the last quarter. What's your next three months look like? What things do we want to accomplish? And, and how do we want to move forward with the last part of the year? So listen, I hope that's great. Listen, we have an Instagram page. So if, you go, if you're on Instagram, go to Out From The Cube. We also have a YouTube page. It's not out from the cube, but I think just search for, look in the show notes. I'll put it in the show notes. You can have this if you want to just watch the video. Please subscribe. So if you're watching this, I'm pointing down uh, low. There's a red subscribe button right there. Subscribe to this. That'd be really cool. Uh, share it. Subscribe to it. Uh, I appreciate uh, the support. I appreciate the text messages. I appreciate the LinkedIn messages. Um, I get a lot of juice out of this. I'm ready for the week. I'm finishing up. It's about 8.45 Monday morning. This is about how it will kind of work. I apologize. I don't have it ready at 4 a.m. Um, we're going to have a great week. I'm still lining up some guests for Thursday. Subscribe, share, uh, comment, like. Um, we have the YouTube. We have the Instagram. Follow me on LinkedIn. And if there's anything we can do to help you, listen, have a great week. We covered a lot. But I guess I would start with this because it's the first thing Kobe said. You can be whatever you want to be, but it comes with work. And our professional lives, like how he approached basketball, can be two, two phrases. It's math, and you got to chunk it up and put a menu together of what you want to accomplish. And that's how I'm moving forward today. Hope you have a great week. I'm ready for the Monday. Crush it. Reach out to me on those uh, platform channels. Appreciate you listening. Have a great week.